Hello everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today I'm going to give you guys another Biomed Basics video and we're going to cover pulse oximetry, which is SpO2, and end tidal CO2 monitoring, which is also called ETCO2. Both measurements are used to monitor the function of the respiratory and circulatory systems, but how they function and why they're used are quite different in application. Let's start with some background information. The respiratory system mainly consists of the mouth, trachea, lungs, which contain bronchial tubes and alveoli sacs, and lastly, the diaphragm. The circulatory system mainly consists of the heart, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Oxygen-deprived blood leaves the right side of the heart and travels to the lungs. When you breathe, room air, which contains around 21% oxygen, enters the lungs. This air travels deep into the lungs, down the bronchial tubes to the alveoli sacs. At the alveoli sacs, the oxygen molecules are absorbed by the blood in the capillaries, while the carbon dioxide molecules are expelled from the blood. The oxygen-refreshed blood leaves the lungs and travels back to the left side of the heart where it's pumped by the left ventricle to all the various parts of the body. The blood travels down arteries, and at the distant capillaries, there's another oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, and the CO2-rich blood travels down the veins back to the right side of the heart, which completes the cycle, and the cycle starts all over again. Blood vessels traveling away from the heart are called arteries, and blood vessels traveling toward the heart are called veins. Pulse oximetry, or SpO2, is very common. It's measured everywhere. SpO2 is a non-invasive monitoring of a patient's arterial blood oxygen saturation and heart rate. It's quick and easy because it's a simple probe that clips on the end of the patient's finger earlobe, or a skin flap, like with pediatrics. Inside the SpO2 sensor, there's two light-emitting diodes. One is a red diode, LED, and the other is an infrared light-emitting diode. On the other side of the sensor is a photosensor that detects the amount of red light and infrared light that transmits through the tissue. The red light is absorbed by deoxygenated blood, and the infrared light is absorbed by oxygen-rich blood. If there's more red light that makes it through the tissue to the photosensor, but less infrared light, then the computer will calculate a higher oxygen saturation level. Because of the checks and balances of using two different wavelengths of light to measure both oxidized blood and venous blood, SpO2 monitors are extremely accurate. If there are any discrepancies with the readings, it's almost always the sensor or the cabling. SpO2 is the standard for patient monitoring, but it does have some pretty big drawbacks, like a huge delay in the physiological changes, and it doesn't show any data that diagnoses the second half of the circulatory system, cellular metabolism, venous blood, and CO2 diffusion in the lungs. For these shortcomings, we have capnography and end-tidal CO2 monitoring. End-tidal capnography, which is what we also call end-tidal CO2 monitoring, measures continuous trends in CO2 exhaled by the patient with each and every breath. The capnograph charts the waveform of each breath. As the patient exhales, the wave starts an upward spike, and at the very peak of the exhalation is the end-tidal measurement of CO2 measured in millimeters of mercury. Then, immediately after that, the wave takes a downward stroke as the patient inhales, and the cycle starts all over again. There's two types of end tidal sensors, mainstream sensors and sidestream sensors. Mainstream sensors take measurements directly at the main tube connected to the patient. There's no delay in the results as the electrical components are located immediately at the source for the readings. This type of ETCO2 monitor is often found in areas where the patient's intubated, like 
operating rooms, ICUs, and the ER sometimes. Sidestream sensors are located at the monitor itself and use a small hose to take a sample of the gas exhaled by the patient. There's a small delay in the data as the line in the tube changes its percentages, but the sensor is protected from damage by the patient because it's located in the monitor itself. These ETCO2 monitors are found around step-down care units, post-anesthesia care units, PACUs, and general patient rooms. All types of ETCO2 monitors show quick changes in a patient's physiology, so end tidal monitoring is becoming a patient care standard. Capnography shows instant patient reaction to drug therapy, sudden changes in health conditions, and the patient's reaction to mechanical ventilation settings. ETCO2 sensors consist of infrared light emitting diodes which shine across a gas sample exhaled by the patient. That light is measured by a photosensor on the other side of the gas sample. The CO2 naturally absorbs infrared light, so the more infrared light that's measured means a lower amount of exhaled CO2. And inversely, the lower the amount of IR light means the higher amount of exhaled CO2. Normal numbers for a healthy patient are around 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Both SpO2 and end tidal CO2 are vital methods for monitoring a patient's health and each have their best use case scenario. Most people are familiar with pulse oximetry as it's been at every patient bedside monitor and health checkup station for around the last 20 years. But hospitals are taking a strong initiative to incorporate end tidal CO2 monitoring as a standard of patient care because it's been proven to alert on health complications much, much faster than SpO2. Every second counts when you're dealing with a cardiopulmonary emergency. Well, guys, that is all I have for you on end tidal CO2 monitors and pulse oximetry monitoring. If you like these kind of videos, please give me a thumbs up. Subscribe and hit that bell so you won't miss out on my other videos about medical technology and the BMET career field. Thanks for watching, guys.